the area of Bible study that's difficult. It's, it's difficult for your preacher. It's difficult for a lot of Christians. Um, it's difficult for uh, a lot of teachers. There's a, because the teaching here, if you're not careful, it's very easy to err into false doctrine. I, I'm not something great because I don't buy into some of the subject matter in which we have looked at. I just try to dis be discerning according to the scriptures and looking at the world around us. But it is very easy to take a scripture and to err in that scripture and to find yourself caught up in, in a false religion or some false teaching or some false truth. You know, and so you, you go back, I believe it's the book of Acts, and you see that the Bereans, the Berean Christians, what are the Berean Christians noted for? Oh, they were noted for this, that, and the other thing. They were great soul winners. No. What were they, what were they noted for? Studying the Scriptures. They searched the Scriptures, and I believe, it, correct me if I'm wrong on this, and don't, don't be afraid to correct me, but they searched the Scriptures daily to see if those things were true. And if you're... If you misunderstand that verse, here's what you say. Well, on Sunday they came to church and the preacher preached and they went home on Sunday afternoon and Monday morning to find out if what the preacher said was true so that they could go back and tell the preacher that it wasn't true or that he didn't say it exactly. No, they searched the scriptures daily to see if those things were true because they were trying to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and they did not understand. It wasn't so that they could condemn. It was so that they could keep themselves from error. You know, that's two completely separate things. A lot of people will study a lot of stuff just so they can point a finger at somebody else and say, you're wrong and I'm right. A lot of people will study the scriptures so that they can stay on the right side of right and not go towards the wrong. And you don't necessarily have to point your finger at the wrong. Now, we'll expose false doctrine. We will do that. And you hear me do that. And we are well within our right to expose false doctrine. And any, any, any preacher, any teacher that is worth anything, uh, if he is working for God uh, and he's in touch and in tune with the Holy Spirit, he has to expose false doctrine. The Apostle Paul did it. He said we would do that. But ultimately, as Christians... We search the scriptures daily to see if those things are true. What's true? Everything that you hear. Before this day is over, you and I will leave services tonight. You can go home, you can flip on your television. And if you have cable television or, or even just regular television, I am sure that somewhere before the night is over, you can find some preacher on TV tonight, Sunday. They're on there or the broadcast channels, cable channels, whatever, you'll find some preacher that Brother Aaron will be teaching false doctrine. And he will, more than likely. And we can start naming people, and, and they're going to be out there. And now, so here goes Brother Aaron. He goes home, and he's just, man, he's charged up. He goes home, and he turns something on. And man, here's a preacher. And, and, and I mean, his doctrine sounds pretty good. Brother Aaron goes, you know, that sounds pretty good. Now, he has an obligation. He can search the scriptures and see if those things are true to keep himself from that false doctrine. Is that, does that make sense to you? You, you? you should do that. You know how much junk is out there? I mean, more than you and I could digest in several services. Listen, there's not enough time. I would spend all of my preaching time if I went after all the false doctrines and false teachings that are out there. I wouldn't be able to preach about anything else. I mean, man, adding to salvation, taking away from salvation, and, and, and Calvinism, and, and about eight or diff kinds, different kinds of Calvinism. I mean, there's the tulip Calvinism, there's partial Calvinism, there's this, that, and the other thing. Oh, my word. And then you got, you know, baptism, and you got all of these other things. And then you enter into the area in which we've been looking at, which we're going to get into a little bit. Here in this study, you got, you got the charismatic movement, you got the tongues movement, and you got the, I mean, interpretations movement, you got all this other stuff out there. And man, but you know, it just do you well just to read the Bible. Take the Bible for what the Bible says. It's not as complicated of a book as you think that it is. If you just sort of take it and don't, don't take this phrase the wrong way, but just sort of take the Bible at face value while researching what it is that you need to find out. And so when we look at this, uh, when we look at these gifts of the Spirit, and uh, we've said this several times, that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit gives you a gift or more than one. 
And he wants you to use it for the church, the local body of believers. All right? And, uh, and, 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 and because you're to help the body to grow and to function. Okay? Just like your own body, God gave you body parts, and they are to help your body. That's why he gave you two hands and, uh, you know, five digits on each hand and, and all the things. And I explained that to you way back in the beginning, you know, that if you just had the one finger. Remember my illustration? I mean, here it is. Here's your one finger. It's not getting much done. You can open a can, but you can't hold that can, can you, with one finger. I mean, and so they all work together. Uh, and it's the same with the body. The body of Christ works the same way. We were talking with Miss Mary the other day, and she was getting ready to have the appendix out. And, of course, they say that it, it does nothing. The appendix. It is in you. It can rupture, and it does nothing for you. Now, that's untrue. They just don't know what it does. But this is the thought that hit me. Because, first of all, why would God put something in you? Oh, well, he was just filling up space. Yeah? Well, he was filling up space when he created you, too. <laughs> he just said, you know, I need a... Uh, I, well, I won't, I won't say that. I'll keep moving because somebody will get upset with me. Somebody in the room who would I, I would key in on and talk about their characteristics. And now God was filling space. Anyways, I don't want to do that and hurt anybody's feelings tonight because I feel like being nice. Uh, I'll hurt your feelings on Wednesday night. But, uh, but, you know, this thought came to me. And it's not original to me, and I didn't hear anybody. I just, I was thinking about it. What its purpose is, and I don't know. I, I'm sure that, you know, I mean, I, I've just heard that many times. And I, even Miss Mary agreed with me. I think the doctors had said that to her. That, you know, we're going to take it out, and it's really not going to change the function of your body in any way, shape, or form. Okay, well, everything's put there for a reason. But we don't know what, maybe they just don't know what the function is. But this thought came to me on the way to the hospital. Think about this. Was it useful before the fall of man? Think about that. What was its purpose before man fell and made it not useful because of the curse placed upon man? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it helped him because the earth was different back then. I don't have any idea. But you ever think about that? In other words, what I'm getting at is God wasn't just filling up space. He put that in man back in the beginning. Now, if man messed it up and now it doesn't serve any purpose, that's not God's fault, that's man's fault. He just still left it in there. What should he have done with the curse? Reached in and ripped it out? He would have done that, but he didn't do that. And so, uh, just interesting thought. We're talking about the body. Now, it, it, but let's, let's, let's kind of think about that. It's not useless, by the way. It's got to serve some purpose. Because if that were useless, Brother Jeff, honestly, that would mean that someone in the body of Christ, this is a living organism, somebody would be useless. Right over here we have the appendix. You know, here's Brother Eric. I'm sorry, Brother Eric, but you're the appendix and you can be the tonsils, you know. I don't serve any purpose. But we're sure glad that you're here. We're going to give ourselves an appendectomy tonight. Amen. And we're going to call you to be the doctor. Do an appendectomy and escort him out of the building. Okay. That, that wouldn't work that way. Because there is no worthless member in the body of Christ. God has placed you in the body of Christ to help to grow the body of Christ. You have a function here. Everyone has a function. And, and truthfully, you know, he uses people in every capacity. And so he places you within the body so that you can help the body. Now, we may not understand the way that, oh, someone over here, they just don't seem to help the body that much. Well, if we take it out, we may find that the body suffers because that thing is not there anymore. Okay? Everybody is useful to the body of Christ because God doesn't waste any time on any of that. So that usefulness comes when he gives you the gifts that he gives to you because he wants you to use them. Now, the gifts that we're looking at in this sort of run of verses right here are the ones... We talked about prophecy last week, right? We talked about foretelling, prophets, foretelling. But then we talked about foretelling, preachers, prophets, preachers, two different things. Now, prophets preach and preachers prophesy, but we prophesy not from a standpoint of, of, of foretelling, but forthtelling because we already have the prophecy, 
okay? It's, it's all been fulfilled. We have a complete canon of Scripture. There's nothing new that's going to be added to that. God is not revealing anything new. We have his revelation that's right in your lap, okay? Do you want to know what's going to happen in the future? It's in your lap, all right? We don't need a prophet to tell us that. Now, but I, I gave you the, the, the illustration there of forth telling that we can use the Bible and we can rebuke current events according to the word of God. Forth telling, we can say, here's what is going on and, uh, and, and God gives you the foresight. And so well, prophecy is kind of an easy one, but tonight we look at one in the scriptures um, that is not quite as difficult, but the next two after it are extremely difficult, and, uh, and I want to do right according to them. Uh, but we, we've looked at, what did we look at? We looked at healing and miracles, and I believe that we looked at those in the proper context of the Scripture. I do believe that some of that is at work today. It is not the laying on of, of the hand or on the forehead or any of this other crazy stuff, but, and I explained that, and it had, how it had to do with faith and, and so on and so forth, and I, I believe that proper interpretation of the scripture has given us that let's look at this one tonight go to uh let's see go to verse number uh nine to another faith by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits okay and you'll see the next two are in that verse to another diverse kinds of tongues and to another the interpretation of tongues now listen those are difficult tongues and interpretation and they make me nervous but I believe that from the research and, and from the direction that the Holy Spirit, and I've already studied them, and I'll be very simplistic when I get to them, you'll want to hear that uh, if you want to understand really what I believe in this age, in this time in which we live, where that comes into play. You say, you believe it comes into play? Absolutely, I do to a certain degree. We're going to be careful on that though, okay? Uh, and, uh, and some of you are thinking, oh man, preacher's going charismatic, who knows what he's going to talk about. But right now we're going to talk about the discerning of spirits, uh, and uh, let's see uh, where we get tonight. And, and to be honest with you, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation, I, I'm going to be very simplistic, because I think simplistic is, about, is just about the best way that we can approach it. If I, get too, uh, if I go too far on this stuff, I'll confuse you, I'll confuse myself, and then I'll start speaking in tongues. Suzuki Kawasaki. Yamaha, I can do it right there. And, uh, and some, I need somebody to stand up and interpret all of that. They're motorcycles. All right, there we go. <laughs> that's like a, that's a, the discerning of spirits, okay? Uh, what is this discerning of spirits? Let, let, let's pray. Father, give us wisdom tonight, Lord. I pray that as the preacher-teacher uh, functioning, Lord, tonight, more teacher capacity, help me to give your people something that they can grasp hold of. And uh, Lord, there's, there's much practical application here. And so help us to do that. But give me wisdom. Give your people wisdom to discern all of these things in their own life. Find out where they fit the body of Christ and, and properly be used for thee. We'll ask this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the singing of your people. It's been an encouragement. And uh, help us now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, the reason, and let me, let me state this and then I'm going to get into this. The reason that we're studying this is because you truthfully need to know where you fit into the body of Christ. Now, we will use teachers in the church, but not everyone has the gift of teaching. Now, if I have someone with the gift of teaching, okay, and, and by the way, God is going to provide that to a church that needs teachers. Don't you think he's going to? If a church needs teachers, don't you think God's going to provide those with the gift of teaching, knowing for knowledge of God, he knows where they're going to be and what they need to do. Um, and so, but if we have someone with the gift of teaching, but we have them in another area and they're not doing any teaching, but we have someone that has the gift of ministration, it's one of the gifts, and, I, and I'll explain that to you, uh, not this week, but, and, and we have them teaching, can they teach? the person with the gift of ministration. Sure they can. Will they be effective? Maybe. Will they be as effective as the one that has the gift of teaching, that God has given that to them, gifted them in such a manner through the Holy Spirit to use in that capacity? So don't you think as a pastor and also as a membership, you should know where God has gifted you so that you can be in the right place? Don't you think as a pastor, if I come to someone and, uh, and, and, and I say, uh, we have a Sunday school class open. Now listen, we will use people 
in certain capacities as we need people. I'm not talking about that, but I am saying for that, you, uh, there is going to be, and you'll see this when we get to the teaching uh, aspect of things, what, what a teacher uh, is actually would do, this one that has the gift of teaching. But someone can teach and not have the gift of teaching, but they're going to be the most effective if they have the gift of teaching and we put them in the right place. Does that make sense? You want to be in the right place. Parents need to work on this with their children. Children need to know. Parents need to help them and members need to know. And so that we can all be in the right place, okay, where God wants us to be in the body of Christ. When we work together as a body, when my body works together, I get a lot accomplished. But I'm going to tell you, in the morning, when, when my head wants to get up and the rest of my body says, forget what the head is saying, that is good. We have a problem, Brother Hawk, because also the alarm clock is saying, get out of bed. So now we have the head saying, ignore the alarm clock. And the body is, or I mean, the body is saying, ignore the alarm clock. And the head is saying, no, I don't want to hear the alarm clock. Now I got the ears getting into this mess. Well, what should I do? Well, I'm going to give in to one of them. And I'm going to tell you which one you ought to give in to. You ought to give in to the body, man. Stay in bed. <laughs> Glory to God. There's something good about bed in the wintertime. It's nice and warm. It's always cold outside the covers. I don't care how high the heat is in the house. It's always cold outside the covers. All right? So give in. Stay in bed. Forget the rest of life. Close the shades and pretend like it doesn't exist. All right, discerning of spirits. Let's look at it. This is the, uh, this is the ability to distinguish. Now, stay with me so you can get this. Because some of you probably have this, and you'll understand when I get to the end. This is the ability to distinguish between the actions of the flesh, the devils, or the Holy Spirit in the life of someone else. How many of you would think that one would be fairly important? Not only in the world, but in the church. You know, people operate in the flesh. And people need to be discerning about who operates in the flesh and who's operating in the spirit. Okay? Why? Because the works of the flesh manifest are these, adultery, fornication, lasciviousness. You know, it's all about us. Okay, we have to be careful. The one with this gift is able to see the source or the cause of the behavior of someone else. Okay, the word discerning means distinguishing. It means seeing. It means discovering. It means knowing. It means judging. Having power to discern. Capable of seeing, capable of knowing or judging. It means to be sharp-sighted. Okay, let's go to the book of Acts chapter number 5. Go to Acts, chapter number 5. Acts, chapter number 5. And um, we'll look at a couple of verses here. And this is, a, this is a, an interesting uh, gift, this one is. Uh, look at this. Acts, Acts 5, verse number 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought uh, a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Now, how many of you would think that what you've just read in the Scriptures was a bit of discernment? Did, did, did you understand? That was, that was pretty simplistic. He used Brother Eric as an example of this. You'll study the, the, the uh, chapter previous and the chapters previous to this. You, you know, in Acts chapter number 2, and the Holy, Holy Ghost fell, and, and, uh, and the church, the Bible says there that the, the believers, they, they sold their possessions and gave to every man as he had need. And so, uh, for sake of argument, let's say that I owned several pieces of property. And I got saved, I realized I didn't need all of that property because there was a need at the church house or someone else at the church had a need. So I sold off some parts of that and I gave it 
to the work of the ministry, and they parted to every man as every man had need. That's not, by the way, communism, okay? It sounds a lot like take from the rich, give to the poor type of a... But that wasn't what it was. They were all trying to help one another. It really was the way that the church was designed. Do you know if the church would do its part, we, we wouldn't need any government agencies? And you know where it starts at? I'm not being mean, but it doesn't start out there. It starts in here. We are obligated. Christian, listen to me. You and I are obligated to help fellow believers. That's why when we uh, get up, take a special offering, well, preacher's taking him a special offering. I mean, he just took up, and he's going to put new pews, and, 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 uh, and then he's going to take up, and he's going to do this, and he's going to do this. And now he wants us to help sister or brother so-and-so. Yeah, I would rather you help sister or brother so-and-so than put a new color or chair or pad or pew or, or, or put down new carpet. That's the more important thing to do. Amen? We have an obligation to help fellow believers. The, ch the, 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 uh, uh, the, the church, the church in the beginning, this Jerusalem church, which grew exponentially, 100,000 members or more, they say, they believed this because this is what they had. They loved one another. It's a love issue. It is a love issue. And so they sold their possessions. Barnabas did this and, and so on and so forth. So here's a couple. Here's Brother Eric, and he said, um, he, he comes to me, and he says, we have a possession that we're going to sell, and we're going to give X amount of dollars. We're going to give a portion of that or uh, whatever that is, but the Lord has laid this on our heart, and we're going to give X amount of dollars. Okay. And then he goes and does that, but he does not give what he said that he would give. Now, it may not have been a dollar amount, in other words, he didn't say, I'm going to sell this property for $10,000, i am going to give $8,000 to the church. But he might have said, I'm going to give 30% or 50% or whatever it is. I don't believe in this instance, that, it, and uh, let, let, think about this with me, I don't believe that we would see this in the scripture. Here's Peter, and, uh, and, and here's the treasurer, and, and, and here's Eric, and he has, he has told me, and I have said, you watch when he puts the money in, and then you come and report to me that he said he was going to put $10,000 in. I don't think that's the way it operated back then. That's craziness. Why? Because that was an obligation that he made. Where's the obligation in missions? The obligation between you and this church? Where's the obligation between? It's between you and God. Now, you make an obligation to this church, but where is it first? So when you don't, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing missions, when you don't meet the obligation, who are you not giving to? The church, the missionaries, or God? So who are you breaking an obligation that you made to? Okay. You're in far worse trouble than if you break an obligation to this church. You break an obligation to God. <laughs> you vow a vow and defer not to pay it. That would be making a vow. Okay. So, but maybe he said that. I don't think that the treasurer came to Peter, old brother Peter, and said, Hey, preacher. He said he was going to give $10,000, he only gave seven. Oh, and so he calls him up. I don't think that's the way that it went, because I think he had discernment, and I think he had the Holy Spirit. And by the way, the discerning of spirits has to do with the Holy Spirit. He's the one that brings the gift, right? So when he came, the Holy Spirit, and Peter having discernment, he recognized hypocrisy in him immediately when he came. He recognized it. Peter had seen it before. You know when Peter had seen it before? When he looked in the mirror. Think about it. Peter had seen hypocrisy when he stood there with Jesus, as I read this week, and he said, I'm going all... He said, you'll all deny me tonight. And Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes him and says, not me. I'm with you all the way. And he looked at Peter and he said, you're before the cock crows tonight, you're going to deny me thrice. And Peter said, not so, Lord. You want to know about a guy that could understand. You want to know about a guy. And so there was a guy that, yeah, the Holy Spirit would use that in his life. You know, he uses the bad in your life, too, to try to, uh, to, to grow you so that you can help others. He wasn't being critical of Ananias, but here's what he said. He said, I've seen hypocrisy. I'm not talking about anybody else. I'm going to look at myself, and I know that I've seen hypocrisy before. And I'm telling you, I see it in this guy. And so he doesn't say, you said you'd give 10000 and you only gave seven, and I have the tithe record right here, buddy. Is that what he said in the Scripture? you got the Bible right in front of you. What did he say? Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? He said, you said you were going to... Did you do that? Oh, yeah, he said, really? Why has Satan, Satan filled thine heart? 
Why are you lying right now? I don't know what that church service would have been like, but that's one of the things I want to see when I get to heaven. Because, man, if we had a church service like that, all the church would get up and leave. We can't handle this type of Christianity. You know we can't handle Bible Christianity in 2015? Bible Christianity is the man of God gets up and he looks across the pulpit and he points a finger in your face and says, why has Satan, why has Satan uh, uh, convinced thee or why has Satan filled thine heart to lie unto the Holy Ghost? Well, bless God, I'm not going back to that church again. He preached right at me. He said Ananias' name. I haven't called any names lately, but I might. Rick Hawk. Why has Satan filled thine heart? No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to tell you what, if a preacher, not, not me, if a preacher got up and called out one person's name and called them out and, and you saw that, guaranteed, most Christians would not go back to that church again. You want to know why? I might be next. It wasn't like that in first century Christianity. They weren't playing around. They took the things of God seriously. So here, the discerning of spirits, as Peter saw that, he saw the hypocrisy in him, and so he calls him out, and he said, no, I didn't lie, and he went, no, you did lie, sir. Bang! He fell over dead. Here's the church. <gasps> well, what are we going to do now? We better call the coroner. No, he just called some men and said, wind him up and take him out. Now what are we going to do, Peter? We're going to sit here and wait for his wife to show up. Oh, that would have been good. I mean, that would have been good. Here, here we are. We're just waiting. It's awful quiet in the church. What are we singing? Let's sing victory in Jesus. Sapphire is about to show up. Let's sing a couple of songs. Oh, man, they're singing songs. All of a sudden, Sapphire's going, man, he's been down at the church house a long time. Oh, Brother Peter must have really been getting with it tonight. I mean, I wish he'd shut up and let my husband come home. He went down to take that money, and frankly, I'm ready for... I bet she was at home with her bags packed. They were probably going to the Caribbean. Huh? You say, you're reading too much into the Bible. Hey, you're not discerning enough to discern spirits. You don't know what I'm reading into the Bible. And so here he is. But, I mean, honestly, when, she, when he didn't come home, you know what? She said, I'm going to go down there. So here she comes, strolling down to the church. She got her new dress on. She's looking church ready. She comes in. I can see her standing in the back. She's looking around. She's like, man, I don't know where he's at. I don't see him. I, I better go talk to Peter. Where's my husband? Well, I don't know. Did you keep back part of that money? Because we talked to you. Oh, we didn't keep back any. Bam. Well, solve that problem. What do we do with her? Wind her up and carry her out and put her next to her husband. Let's have church. Now, that is, now that's some discerning of spirit. But in all honesty, do you know what Peter was doing? He was discerning a false spirit. Why hath Satan filled thine heart? Think about what Jesus said. Peter, Satan desires to have thee that he may sift thee as wheat. He understood the foe that he was against, and when the foe raised its ugly head, Peter knew it right off the get-go. And do you know what we need, Brother Jeff? We need some discerning Christians in this day in which we live. When the, when the enemy raises his ugly head, it's time to get out the sword of the Word of God and lop that thing off. Cut it off. Discerning spirits can discern uh, uh, this type of, uh, this type of uh, uh, falseness. And so he, he did this here uh, in the scriptures. Uh, uh, he, he noticed this uh, behavior in him uh, was, was, uh, was wrong. Go to, go to Hebrews chapter number 5. Hebrews chapter 5. You're going you're gonna to find the... End statement, when I get to the end of this, very interesting, but I, I'll stand on it because uh, I believe it. Hebrews 5, verse number 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their, what's the next word? Are you looking at it? What's that? Senses. Exercise to discern what? Both good and evil. Do you know what he's talking about? Senses exercise discernment discerning to discern between good and evil Satan hath transformed himself into an angel of light he looks pretty good Eve talked Eve talked to Satan in the garden why was she talking to Satan in the garden 
He must have looked okay. I, I, what, what do we think? We, we, pitchfork, horned, you know, here he is. If, if man, if they got angel of light, if that approached me, you know, in all honesty, you're living in a garden, that approach, you're going to run the other direction. She, she, he, he, he approached her, and she wasn't afraid of that. That was a message for another day, uh, what snakes looked like back then. Go home, think about that for a minute, all right? Uh, but here, uh, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. It's talking about spiritually mature individuals. Uh, go to Galatians chapter number 1. Back a few pages, Galatians chapter number 1. Galatians 1, verse number 6. Paul said this, I marvel that ye are so, so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that ye have received, let him be accursed. What's he talking about? He is talking about false gospel, false teachers, wrong spirit coming in, preaching a false gospel. He said, let him be accursed. An angel from heaven preaches any other gospel than what I preached to you as the apostle Paul. He said, let him be accursed. Don't listen to it. He's talking here about the discernment of false teachers. Uh, the, uh, go to one, one other place, and then, well, there's a few other uh, uh, scriptures here, but go to Acts chapter number 6. Just give me five more minutes. Acts chapter number 6. Look at verse number 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who may, whom, whom we may appoint over this business. Go to verse number five. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and, uh, and Prochorius, and Nic uh, Ni I'm sorry, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Go to verse number 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. They're talking about Stephen. Now, understand, do you know what they have appointed in this scripture verse? Deacons. Do you know that Stephen was a deacon that got stoned for preaching? He was full of wisdom and the spirit of God. He was discerning, and he called out a group, and they got angry at him. He was a man that was full of the Spirit, and he, uh, and he was preaching against the, the spirit of the current air, the things that were going around. Okay, uh, look at this. Everyone, every one of us needs to have some form of discernment. This is, not, this is not just for the person that is gifted. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, because, Christian, you better have some discernment in your life, or you are going to... Uh, well, the scripture's going to tell us what will happen. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5 and verse number 21. It says, prove all things. The word prove carries that thought of being discerning of all things. All things. Uh, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and look at verse number 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come unless there come a falling away first, and that man uh, of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So here, let no man deceive you. Now, if I'm not deceived, if I'm not supposed to be deceived by someone, don't you think that that's going to take a little bit of discernment on my part to not be deceived? Let's go to 1 John chapter number 4. 1 John chapter number 4. Verse number one, beloved. Who's beloved? Who is he speaking to? The church. Okay, good, good. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. How many of you think he's talking about discernment? 
And he's talking to who? Believers. He said, Miss Anna, you need to be discerning. He said, Brother Aaron needs to be discerning. He said, Brother Eric needs to be discerning. And he said, Miss Emily needs to be discerning. Beloved. And he said, Miss Madison needs to be discerning. You say, look, teenagers, they don't, they don't know anything. Really? You might be surprised. I'm starting to think that some of the young people of our church are more discerning than some of the more seasoned people in our church. And I'm not talking about age. I'm talking about Christianity speaking. You know, sometimes they know what's going on. Miss Danielle, Brother Elliot, Brother Joe, you, you, everyone in this room, I'm not leaving you out either over there. Okay? But you're all supposed to be discerning. Believe not everything. Every wind of doctrine, every, everything that comes along. But, but we, we, does not the Bible say that our spirit bears witness with the spirit? So in other words, here's how that works. If someone else has the spirit of God and I have the spirit of God, don't you think that my spirit is going to bear witness with their spirit? And if they do not, do you not think that a little bit? See, we're not very discerning and sometimes we have a hard time with that. But we really shouldn't. Now, I'm not saying we go around accusing everybody of not being saved because, but I'm telling you, there are some things that take place sometimes and people get a little sideways when the preacher or, or, or something like that says, you know, I'm, well, I'm wondering about people's salvation. Well, maybe it's because our spirits aren't bearing witness with their spirit. And, and they've got a spirit, but it's a small ass. Believe not every spirit, but try them. Try the spirits, okay? Whether they be of God. Go to Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation chapter number 2. Revelation 2.2. 2. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, hmm. and hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Do you know this was a commendation for the church at Ephesus? You know, you know what he was saying? He was saying, boy, church at Ephesus, he goes, you're very discerning. And he said, some prophets have come along, but you have tried their spirits, you have been discerning, and you have found them to be false prophets, and you kicked them to the curb. And he said, for that I commend you. But yet, you know the, you know the church at Ephesus isn't around anymore? You know, if we go there today, there's nothing there. It's completely gone. They were missing some other things. But one thing he commends them for, he said, you had some discernment. You could pick up uh, on false prophets and on false spirits, and, uh, and, and you didn't allow that stuff uh, to, to uh, be a determinant to you. There is, so that's, the, that's for everyone. He's talking to the church right here, the church at Ephesus. He wasn't talking to just one or two. He was talking to the church at Ephesus. But I want to give you uh, just two characters that had the gift of the Spirit. I already gave you one. It was Peter. We see that when he had a confrontation, okay, uh, with them. There's also another place in the Scripture. Uh, you go to the book of Acts, and we'll stay there and, uh, and, and wind it down. Acts uh, chapter number uh, 8 is also talking about Peter in this passage of Scripture. Acts 8, verse number 18. Acts 8, verse number 18. And when uh, Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that in whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in the matter, for thine heart is not right in the sight of God. And uh, he goes on, uh, verse number 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. I perceive. See that word? Y'all circle it. That's discernment. You know what he said? He said, man, you're in trouble, Simon. He said, you have the wrong motive right here. You're in trouble. Now, there's a lot of disputes about what's going on here, whether he was saved in the goal of bitterness, whether he was not saved. I'm not going to give you my uh, dissertation on that tonight because I don't want to uh, go down that road. But um, he definitely, the Apostle Peter, had some discernment. Here's another character, the Apostle Paul. Go to Acts 13. Acts 13. Acts 13, verse number 9, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? 
And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist of a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. And, uh, and, and I'll just stop my reading there. And listen, the Apostle Paul was gifted with the discerning of spirits. And he saw this immediately uh, in this man. There's other places in the scriptures. Uh, chapter number 16, you have the Apostle Paul. Remember that young lady, I believe, is Acts chapter number 16. There's a young lady following them. And, uh, and she was full of spirits working. She made, uh, she made money for her masters. And he turned around and pointed a finger at her. And, buddy, he discerned that right away. Now, some of that discerning of spirits is very easy. It's not always that easy. But I'll, I'll sort of close with this. Some have that gift. Now, the Apostle Peter had it. The Apostle Paul had it. There's other characters in the Bible that if we did a Bible study, we could, uh, we could uh, uh, see these other Bible characters that had that. All of us need to have it. We need to be discerning about false doctrine. We need to be discerning about others. You know, we live in a day and age, and, and I believe this, where individuals will, will, will come in. You know what? Here's a good one. Here, here's a good one. I'll use this as an example. We ought to be discerning, and it's not just for the preacher, but others in the fold who God has blessed in this area, discerning when a wolf comes in. I heard a preacher say recently, you know how you take care of a wolf with a headshot. And he's right. That's how you take care of a wolf when he comes into the sheepfold with a headshot. Take him out. Sometimes people get the idea, well, that's just the preacher being mean. But you know, if others had some discerning of the spirit, we would keep that. What did the Apostle Paul said? Know that after my, uh, know that after my, uh, uh, after my leaving, after my decease, I think is the word he used, but there shall enter in uh, 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 wolves, grievous wolves, and they're not going to spare the flock, is what he was saying over there, Acts chapter number 20. He says, they're going to come along and they're going to try to destroy the church. And he said, I'm putting you on notice, church. You better have some discernment and you better know who's for you and who's not for you and who's trying to cause disruption. And I'm telling you, we're living in a day and age and so much of false teaching and so much and people come into church and they underhandedly begin to do things, right? And I don't think he would mind me saying it, but Brother Aaron told me about his brother uh, had a fellow in his church when he, or I mean, I'm sorry, after he left. Uh, and the church uh, that he was pastoring out there in the, in the Dakotas, uh, that church has formulated a new church in another city. And all of a sudden, a fella came in there. And he looked good. He started working, I, I believe, with the teens and maybe some other areas. But all of a sudden, the, the preacher sort of started getting this, like he was some false doctrine. And, and he's teaching some people some other things. And he's kind of getting this group unto himself. And the preacher got a little like, whoa, 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 what should I do? And he called, uh, I think he called Brother, uh, uh, brother Brown's, or Brother uh, Ian, Brother Aaron's brother. He called him, and I believe he asked him and, and some other things. And he said, man, give him a headshot. Kick that dude to the curb and kick him there really fast. Well, people might get upset about it. That's all right. Let people get upset. Hey, you might lose, but you save. And, and so thank the Lord for, for a preacher uh, that had some discernment about someone. But listen, he was, he was, he was underhandedly befriending. Let me, let, me, let me take you aside and let me, let me tell you something. Let's have a Bible study at my house. Well, does the preacher know about this Bible study? We're, we're getting a bunch of people together. Does the preacher know about these Bible studies? No, don't you worry about the preacher. And it's not that we're the be-all, end-all of authority. Don't you, don't you misunderstand that? I don't know. But, but I'm going to tell you, when that stuff, we, we ought to be a little discerning, Christian. And you know, that's not for me. That's for you. It's okay for you to say, well, who else is going to be at the Bible study? Well, what are we going to be talking about and what's going to be going on? Does the preacher know about it? I mean, uh, is this a church function? What do we got going on here? Oh, yeah, preacher knows about it, blah, blah, blah. Hey, you go to the Bible study, man. Things are great. Praise the Lord. We're, we're all for Bible study. We're all for doing all those kinds of things. But I'm going to tell you, what happens a lot in these situations is when that thing turns into anything other than get up and say, I'm out of here. I'll see you later. That's discerning of spirits. Well, people won't like me. That's all right. I'd rather be accepted in the beloved than liked by someone. It's far more important. 
We need to be a little bit discerning. We got to be careful, Christian, because here's the thing. The devil wants to destroy you. And I don't care if you've been saved 50 years or five minutes, he wants to destroy you. And the, re the way that he does that, he's sly. He gets in there, messes up teaching a little bit. That's why we try to find out what teachers are teaching at the Calvary Baptist Church. Man, we believe a certain set of things around here, a certain set of doctrines, and we're not going to have someone teaching something contrary to the doctrine of this. And if we hear about it, we're not going to just give you a headshot. We're, we're going to let everybody know. And you're not going to be teaching anymore. Don't you think that that's right? Your kids might sit in that class. My grandkids might sit in that class, and so might yours. Don't you want them hearing the right thing? Discerning of spirits ought to be a little bit discerning. Here was a poll that was taken closing on this poll. When a survey was taken, this just recent, when a survey was taken among several hundred pastors, you say, who has this? 90% of the pastors, 90% said that they did not feel like they had this gift. Who, who do you think should have the gift of discerning of spirits? 90% of pastors polled, several hundred of them, said they did not feel like they had this gift. But lest you shut it down right there, over 90%, over 90% of that same group of pastors, you know what they said? I'm pretty sure my wife does. I just gave you sort of a clue as to where you might find that. I'm not saying that men don't, we have the Apostle Paul. We have the Apostle Peter, but I'm going to tell you, she's not up here, so it won't embarrass her, that there has been many a thing that my wife has said to me because she is discerning a situation, and I did not see it that way, and she has said, be careful, or this, or this, or this. Well, you're the woman, you're inferior, and I'm the man, bless God, and you ought to listen to me. And you know what? She's been right. Thank the Lord. Women, ladies, listen to me. I do, I do believe this, and I will say this. I do believe that that is a gift that God does give to women. I didn't say all women have it, but I do believe there are some women that have that. I do believe that in the pastoral relationship, that may be one, and pastors may have it, they just may not feel like they have it. Um, but I do believe that in the pastoral relationship. Remember I told you that... Uh, in a pastor in a, in a pastor's relationship that the pastor will be gifted in a lot of areas and so will his wife so they can complement each other in the ministry. Do you know it's the same for you? So I don't necessarily think that a pastor needs to have this, but if his wife had it and she could help him. Now that doesn't mean his wife is saying, you ought to throw so-and-so out of the church or you ought to do this or, you know, man, they're full of seven devils. Most of the people in the church are full of seven devils. Do you, but do you get what I'm saying? is that there might be some discernment there. Why? Because as, as, as from a pastoral standpoint, sometimes we work with people, and you know what? Contrary to what some people may think, we really do love people, and we really do want to see the best in them. We really do want them to, to achieve the best. And so you know what we'll do? We'll sort of look at everybody, contrary to what some may say, through rose-colored glasses. Well, it's really not that bad. And yet here on the other side of that, and not being a critical condemning wife, don't misconstrue that, but having some discernment, and especially in the situation, I'm going to tell you what messes more preachers up nowadays than anything else, why more preachers leave the ministry, and you already guessed it in your mind, females. It blows more men of God out, pornography, and all this other rubbish. So many preachers get messed up in that, uh, and, and, and there's no excuse for it, but the excuse they give is because of the stress and because of the pressure and because of the this, and it's acceptance and it's away from everything else, whatever the case may be. The bottom line is, is I will tell you, there has been more than one time that my wife has said, be careful, do not have private conversation. Honey, I'm telling you, do not, because there's something not right there and you're going to find yourself on the other end of that. She, she didn't say, I don't trust you. She was saying, I don't trust them. <laughs> and not what they might do, but in today's society, it's what they might say. And when there's nobody else around, phone conversation, text message, Facebook messaging. Hmm? My wife picks my phone up all the time, checks my, checks my text. I don't really care. 
knock yourself out, honey. You want to see who I'm talking to? I have very few females in my phone, and all the ladies, members of the church, they, they know that. I was a few times, ladies of the church will text me about certain things. I'll tell my wife about it. Well, you're just old-fashioned. Yeah. That's right. I love my wife, and I'm trying to keep her. <laughs> and I want her to keep me, Brother Jeff. <laughs> it's not me keeping her that's the problem. It's her keeping me. <laughs> Do you understand? Discerning. You say, do, do those people have an evil spirit? And I'm going to tell you, there's been some. And I wonder. And I have taken information given to me that I got from my wife, and I have passed that information on to others and said, be careful. Just be careful. Well, you know, it's okay for us to listen to that. Amen. And when somebody says that to you, somebody trying to help you, let's be a little discerning, okay? Father, we thank you tonight for the Holy Spirit. Lord, he does indwell in us.